Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. Welcome to Scripture and Tradition, where we look at our faith through its sources, sacred scripture and sacred tradition. And today we will discuss our Lord Jesus' experience of being mocked as he hung on the cross. And we'll look at that with the view of examining some of the mockery that many of the victims of abuse have experienced from people around them. So uh, this is a very important experience. And of course, we would welcome you that if you have a question or comment related specifically to today's topic, we'd invite you to be part of the show by calling us at 1-800-221-9400. Four six zero one eight hundred two two one nine four six zero. Now, of course, that works only in North America. So, if you're outside North America, you can still call, but you need to call country code one, area code two o five two seven one two nine eight zero. So one two o five two seven one. 2980. Or you can also reach us by email by writing to scriptureandtradition at ewtn.com. You can also follow us and participate with the show on YouTube. Now, we are going through chapter six of my book, Wheat and Tares, Restoring the Moral Vision of a Scandalized Church. The book is still available at EWTN's religious catalog which is EWTNRC.com, where it is item number 81098. And we are starting today's discussion on page 144, if you have that book and are following with us. Now, we've already discussed some of the times that uh, our Lord has been mocked, and this is his fifth experience of mockery. Uh, he was hanging on the cross with onlookers right there, and he was fastened by nails in his hands and in his feet. And we see four distinct groups of people mock him, and they mock him for his failure to save himself. Now, just to keep in mind, Golgotha was a section of an old quarry. It was a stone quarry for limestone. And you know how quarries usually look, that you'll have the surface, then you go down like a step because they take the stone out from one level, then you go down it looks like another step, and they've taken out the stone. And there was one section that they left intact. They didn't cut that into blocks, most likely because it was too soft for building. Limestone is formed when the ocean covered the land, and it's formed from shells and fish bones and things like that um, that accumulate on the bottom, and then the water pressure, you know, covers it and compresses it, and it becomes stone. And that uh, it, all of Israel was covered by the ocean for about five million years, and, and that was 30-some million years ago. Uh, dinosaurs were already long past, uh, but they, they were covered by the uh, ocean, and that limestone built up. The problem is not all of it is uh, dense enough to build with. It can be a little, very chalky, a little bit chalky, and so it has different grades. So they left that one section of stone, and it's because white, uh, limestone is white, they just left this one area and that's why it looked like a skull. That's why it's called the skull place. 
because it looked like a skull sticking out. But if you go inside the Holy Sepulchre Church, you can still see on the ceiling, go down to where they found the true cross, the, that's called the Chapel of St. Helena. You can see in the ceiling where they had cut stone out. So it's, you know, all that evidence is still there. And uh, this was just outside the city at that time. Uh, and you can even see the original threshold of the old gate uh, in the lower level, the basement level of the church of uh, St. Uh, Alexander. It's a Russian Orthodox Church from the right Russian Orthodox Church. Um, they uh, uh, excavated and you can see the old steps that went up to the church that Constantine built. And then just below that, you see the gate. And our Lord would have crossed over that threshold to get out of the city to Calvary. So that's what's going on. And because it was a large gate, people would be coming and going back and forth, you know, through the gate. Uh, some of them getting ready to celebrate Passover. Some would have brought their lambs already. Some are bringing them back with them. Others are still taking them over to the temple, which is on the east side of the city. So this is some, something that we see that people who looked at him you know, hanging on the cross, you know, mocked him and were wagging their heads. Like, oh, man, what did this guy do? He must have been really bad. Uh, that kind of thing. And we see in Matthew 27, beginning with verse 39, some of what they did, that those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Pretty much the same thing is said in Mark 15, verse 29 to 30. Now, there's a couple things. Just as at our Lord's trial before the Sanhedrin, they are not quoting what Jesus had said. When he had said, we, we just heard this gospel. If you went to Mass in the Roman Rite this weekend, the gospel of uh, John chapter 2, verse 13 and following, uh, has him say, destroy this temple and I will raise it up. He didn't say he will build it again because he was not talking about the building of the temple. He was talking about the temple of his body. So they heard according to their ability. They, they heard, uh, destroy the temple, I'll build it up. They, they couldn't help but think of the building of the temple. But he is not talking about that. He's talking about raising up his body. And, that, and that's a significant difference. So this is the way that they mock him, trying to use his own words. And then we see another group, the chief priest from the Sadducee party, and also the elders of the Pharisee party. They say in Matthew 27, verse 42 to 43, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And again, you see that in the parallels in Mark 15, 31 to 32. Luke 23, verse 35. So this is uh, a very important uh, thing that he says here. Now, first of all, it's noteworthy. None of these people spoke directly to Jesus. They're speaking among themselves. They're doing the mockery without addressing him. And they're using this taunt not to talk to Jesus, but to justify themselves. They want themselves to look good. That's why they, they mock him. And 
they, they uh, based their ridicule partly on the titulus, you know, the sign that we always see before the, uh, above the head of Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. So we see in Luke 23, verse 37, if you are the King of the Jews, save yourself. Now, at that point, we see the, the third group, the Roman soldiers. The Roman soldiers actually speak directly to Jesus. They're the ones who talk to him and, and say, if you're the king of the Jews. And the, they had put that sign above his head. So they're using that sign to mock him. But they're at least speaking right to him. And, you know, uh, he actually doesn't say anything, but at least they're talking to him. The fourth group that mocks him, he had the crowds, the leaders of the Sadducees and Pharisees, thirdly, the soldiers, and now we have the criminals between whom he was crucified. And we see this, um, you know, where, where they also, like the soldiers, the criminals actually speak to Jesus himself. Um, in Matthew 27, verse 44, the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Presumably that, you know, they reproached him, you're the king of the Jews, get yourself down. So this is something that, uh, first of all, is very important to understand. These taunts were seen as the fulfillment of old Testament prophecies. This is something that goes back. So, for instance, in Psalm 22, verse 7, and we're going to see this psalm quoted a little bit later on. Verse 1 will be quoted later. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But here, as all these people taunt Jesus, it's fulfilling Psalm 22, verses 7 and 8. All who see me mock at me, they make mouths at me, they wag their heads, saying, he committed his cause to the Lord, let him deliver him, let him rescue him, for he delights in him. So that's one fulfillment of uh, 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 Old Testament passage. We already saw Psalm 22 was being uh, uh, fulfilled when the soldiers pierced his hands and feet. That's in Psalm 22. They numbered all his bones when they scourged him. And then they divided his clothes and cast lots for his raiment. So that's also in Psalm 22. So Psalm 22 is getting fulfilled a lot here. But then we also see that besides Psalm 22, Psalm 109, verse 25, which says, I am an object of scorn to my accusers. When they see me, they wag their heads. And then in a still later book, in the book of wisdom, the wisdom of Solomon, this was a book written in the first century A.D., in Alexandria, Egypt, and it was actually composed in Greek. It was taken out of the Old Testament by Martin Luther and by a number by the Puritans. They took it out. Uh, it had been even in the original King James Bible in the 1611 edition. It was there but it was removed in the 1627 edition. Uh, if you go to the Bible Museum in Dallas, Texas, you can see that they oftentimes have the, their original 1611 King James Bible open to Sirach or Wisdom or one of those books, because it's in there. But at any rate, um, Wisdom has been in our Bible, the oldest copy we have of an entire Christian Bible goes back to 325 and 
the Book of Wisdom is in there, along with the other uh, six books. So this is part of our Catholic faith to keep the Bible in its entirety. And sometimes people say, well, there's nothing in there about prophecy, nothing about Christ's uh, crucifixion or death and salvation. That's not true. Only people who have not read it could say that. In Wisdom chapter 2, beginning with verse 13, we read, He professes to have knowledge of God and calls himself a child of the Lord. He became to us a reproof of our thoughts. The very sight of him is a burden to us because his manner of life is unlike that of others and his ways are strange. We are considered by him as something base and he avoids our ways as unclean. He calls the last end of the righteous happy and he boasts that God is his father. Let us see if his words are true. Let us test what will happen at the end of his life. For if the righteous man is God's son, he will help him and will deliver him from the hand of his adversaries. Let us test him with insult and torture that we may find out how gentle he is and make trial of his forbearance. Let us condemn him to a shameful death, for according to what he says, he will be protected. And is that, can you find something much more specific than that about predicting the crucifixion and death of our Lord? I don't think so. I don't think so. So these show that prophetic nature of the uh, Old Testament as well as uh, the, you know, the universality mocking everybody, mocks and taunts, but in regard to the Messiah, the Old Testament predicted it very specifically. And these are the things that happened as Jesus our Lord was hanging on the cross. Now, of course, the uh, mockery is a common thing, but one of the sad things to me, and I've come across this among various victims of the sex abuse scandal that occurred in the church, that mockery of the people who were abused goes on. I, I had one man very foolishly uh, make a joke of it on one of my radio shows. This is nothing to joke about. You're talking about people experiencing tremendous pain. And it's not the source of, uh, 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 you know, mockery and ridicule. Uh, it's something that people mocked p those victims because, well, you hung out with a priest. What did you expect? Um, or uh, there was one case. I remember it was a man from Germany. They did a documentary about the abuse case in Germany. And he was saying how, you know, uh, people made fun of him and they blamed him. Um, this is something that has been going on. And, you know, they said that they knew this guy did it, which I think was something of a tacit admission that some of them may also have been abused, but they don't want to make, you know, say it out loud. And other people are mocked for believing Catholic faith. And, you know, some of them who want to receive Jesus Christ and the Holy Eucharist um, experience this rage, you know, that how can they receive communion from the hands of a priest, especially if one, another one had abused him? And this is something that, you know, that they deal with. Now, the fact is, any such abuse of anyone, whether a minor or an adult, by anybody in the church, but in particular way by uh, clergy, uh, this is against Catholic moral teaching. The Catholic Church doesn't encourage that. Did Catholics fail to correct it? Did Catholics commit it? Yes. But that goes against Catholic teaching, just like there are Catholics who have abortions. It's not because the church allows it. 
It's contrary to our teaching. Catholics commit the other, uh, or break the other commandments of God. Some of them murder, some of them steal, and lie, and uh, commit adultery, dishonor their parents, fail to go to church on Sunday. Um, they, they do these things. That doesn't mean that any of that is morally acceptable. It's not. And one of the things that sometimes also happens is that the people who experience that mockery feel bad because they already feel like fools for having gone to, you know, they've given into the temptation or being, you know, victimized. They feel badly about that enough, and then the mockery just goes to that. Well, in this scene of Christ being mocked, it's very important for them to speak to Jesus, pay attention to the way he was mocked, and realize that he went through the same thing as he was doing what was inherently good to redeem us from our sins. He suffered that. And I would strongly recommend that anyone who's gone through that kind of mockery identify with Christ there, talk to him about the experience, engage in it, and see, you know, what would he say to you as in the midst of his mockery, and what would he say to you about yours? What would be his attitude toward you? And to, by picturing that and being there with him in that moment, he is able to bring a type of healing for that experience that nobody else really can. It's because he's right there in the experience with those who are victimized by mockery. Let that experience of Christ come deeply into your heart to bring healing of that experience and to elevate you to his level, to bring you up to what, you know, his ability to overcome that and eventually to become the source of great praise. It takes time and it's a process, but I guarantee that our Lord will help people to be able to meet him there and come through it with great, greater strength than they thought they possibly could. We're going to take a little break and we'll come back with another experience of our Lord's mockery, so please stay with us. Thank you. Welcome back. Um, first of all, before we get back to our topic, I just want to mention that you can join Father Miguel Marie uh, of the MFVAs um, uh, on a pilgrimage to the shrines of Italy and the Amalfi Coast of Italy. That'll be September 19th to October 1st of this year, 2024. You can also visit Assisi and see the tombs of St. Francis and St. Clair. Uh, also see the relics of St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Timothy in Otorna and Termoli. Uh, visit San Giovanni Rotondo to see the confessional and the, uh, used by Padre Pio, uh, as well as his tomb. And then go along the Malfi coast to Sorrento, uh, then to Pompeii and then Rome. So if you are interested, go to Visitation Pilgrimages dot com or call 256-347-1475. 256-347-1475. All right. Now, we are beginning the uh, sixth experience of mockery that results in a conversion. Now, St. Luke 
pays more attention to the mockery that was done by the two criminals on, uh, uh, on either Jesus' right and uh, left. And he had learned this tradition in Jerusalem. Remember, St. Luke had accompanied St. Paul uh, beginning uh, in the uh, spring of 58. He traveled from Philippi in what's now Greece and Macedonia, and then came to the Holy Land uh, where Paul was arrested in Jerusalem and kept under house arrest in Caesarea Maritima. But St. Luke gathered a lot of his knowledge of the life of Christ from Christians in Jerusalem be between May of 58 and the end of 59 uh, B, uh, A.D. And as he was doing that, he learned about the thieves. That's why only he has it. He was in Jerusalem, and Jerusalemites had told him about that. So we see uh, how one of the thieves railed at Jesus, as he says, and said to him, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us along the way. You know, he wants Christ to save him too. Um, the other thief rebukes him. This is, by the way, in Matthew um, 23, verses 39 to 40. Um, after the thief says, are you not the Christ, save yourself and us? The other one rebuked him, saying, do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. So they're conversing with each other. Now one to, speaks to Jesus. The second one speaks to the thief that's mocking Jesus. And then that thief said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, to your kingly power, that this is, uh, 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 and a matter of fact, it's uh, remember me when you come into paradise is probably a little more accurate. And this is a very important thing because people can find themselves, as a matter of fact, I would suggest that any of the priests who have done the abuse or the brothers or other religious who did any kind of abuse, but also any other person who committed serious sin can take a look at this and realize each of us has to make a choice. Will we side with the thief that mocked Jesus or will we uh, side with the thief that spoke to him, uh, asking to be remembered in, when he comes into paradise. So this is something that uh, is, in fact, correct. Uh, when, when anybody who does abuse of children and gets caught suffers quite a bit. You know, uh, of course, they can end up in jail. They can lose their jobs. Um, and if they're clergy, they can lose their ability to ever exercise the priesthood again. They lose their reputations. If they are criminally uh, convicted, they can lose their freedom by going to prison. Um, and in prison, you know, there are a lot of inmates who, a high, high percentage of inmates have been abused sexually before they ever got into prison. It has that kind of devastating effect on them, usually by members of their family or even more commonly uh, by their mother's boyfriends. That's much more common. Um, and with that kind of abuse, the other inmates will oftentimes uh, do harm to child sex abusers that go to prison. That's not a class that they like. As Inmates have told me that's considered the lowest rung 
of uh, people in prison. They have their own hierarchy in there. And, you know, this is something that in the face of it, we have to make a choice. We can call for Jesus to save us, but do so in a mocking kind of way, like the first thief did. We can um, try to call him to say, well, just get me out of this punishment. This is too much or whatever. Just get me out of here. If you're, if you're God, get me out of here. Or the other option is to own up to their own responsibility and take responsibility for what choices they made, the guilt that they have done. It's not just guilt feelings. It's an important distinction. The, the bad spirit, the, the Satan, will try to manipulate us with feelings of guilt. But when there is actual guilt for our sins, we need to own up to the full responsibility and ask for forgiveness and ask Christ for ultimate redemption, recognizing this is my fault, but I trust that your mercy is stronger than my sin. Now notice the so-called good thief didn't ask to be taken away from the punishment. He recognized he deserved what happened to him. But he also humbly petitioned Jesus to remember him in his kingdom. And the good thief had come to believe. You know, he'd been on the cross and he saw that Titulus, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, he came to believe it as he watched that and watched the way Jesus died and suffered and experienced mockery. He recognized that he really is the king and I want to be in his kingdom. And in that sense, he had come to understand Jesus' initial preaching. Remember in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The good thief did just that. He repented and believed in the gospel. And because of that, he is called a saint. He is Saint Dismas, famous because, as Archbishop Sheen used to say, his last act on earth was theft. He stole heaven by repenting and believing. And this is something each one of us can do. Actually, it's not so much a theft because actually Christ wants to give us forgiveness and bring us into heaven. But this is uh, something that each of us has to accept. And no matter what our sin, no matter how grave the sin might be, our task is to forgive. Our task is also to seek God's forgiven, forgiveness and to become saints ourselves. We'll stop there. Next week, we'll start to take a look at the Blessed Mother uh, at the cross and uh, more of our Lord's suffering. But I think we'll stop there and start taking a look at some of the questions. We have a nice studio audience here from the Diocese of Tampa, and we have a question from our audience. Father, you, are you uh, from Tampa, Tampa itself? I'm from the Tampa Bay area, yes. There you go. Good to have you here. And what's your question? Thank you, Father. My question is, well, during the abuse crisis, I think a lot of people appreciated expressions of sympathy from the church for the victims, but yeah. were upset with a lack of anger shown toward the perpetrators. Is there a place for righteous anger in those cases, whether from Catholics or especially from Catholic leadership? Yeah, I think, I think so. Remember, Scripture says, first in the book of Proverbs, and then St. Paul quotes that proverb in Ephesians chapter 4, be angry, but sin not. 
That's an important principle. There is a type of anger. Anger is uh, an important emotion. Uh, it's a fearful one in many ways um, because anger is something that can cause a great deal of damage. And especially if, uh, as we say in popular speech, uh, I lost my temper. You know, anger can get control of us. That's what we mean by losing our temper. Anger gets control of us, and we sometimes can use it to get back at people, to get revenge or something like that. That's foolishness. You don't get revenge. But our anger can motivate us to make sure that we get justice for what has been done to those who are vulnerable. And, you know, I think you know, there are a couple of re parts of that reaction in the church. A lot of clergy and a lot of the bishops were, you know, you know sucker punched by this. They didn't expect this kind of thing to be going on. You know, they themselves are priests. When we're studying in the seminary, we look up to priests. And I don't think they expected this to start happening. And just as uh, oftentimes happens in life, your, your first reaction is, is one of confusion. And that, I think, occurred a lot. Secondly, while that was, you know, the, this shock uh, of this happening, uh, that certainly was my first reaction. I said, I couldn't, it's hard to believe. Uh, but the other thing about it is that you have a lot of issues coming at you. You had the press and the lawyers and courts and, the, the, of course, the, the suffering of the victims. And, you know, how to deal with this is, you know, overwhelmed because that's so much coming in at once from a variety of sources. And I think a lot of times they were trying to be, you know, very sensitive to the victims. They really wanted to care for them. And, um, and the anger at the perpetrators was something that they may have, you know, missed. So, um, you know, so I, I think it was not any kind of obnoxiousness, but rather, you know, so much was going on at once and how to deal with the anger. And I know many of them were very angry at, at you know, the lots. A number of the superiors and bishops were lied to by the perpetrators. Uh, and they're trying to deal with that as well. And, you know, a lot of times behind the scene, they were very angry, but they didn't know how to deal with that in a public format and express that without it getting out of control, without losing their temper. So I think those combination of things are going on, and it was suffering for them too. So that's what we have there. Uh, let's take a little break. We have some emails and more questions from our audience and from you. So we'll be back with you in just a couple minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, first, I'd like to invite you to join me tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for EWTN Live. We'll be speaking with Dr. Anthony Lills, uh, STD, and discuss his work on a new episode of EWTN's television series, Doctors of the Church. 
This series will be highlighting the Spanish doctor saints, Saints John of Avila, Teresa of Avila, and John of the Cross. We'll discuss how Catholic Spain was able to avoid the Protestant Reformation by an internal Catholic Reformation of calling people to great holiness. So uh, please stay uh, tuned with us for that show as well. All right, let me go to an email here that comes to us from Rick in the great state of Vermont. Rick asks this, Father Mitch, Jesus was fully divine and fully human. Were there situations when he was acting with one or the other nature only? Were there situations when he acted with a combination of both natures? More specifically, isn't it true that God cannot suffer? Therefore, during the crucifixion, was he only acting under his human nature? Thanks so much. Um, first of all, uh, a couple things, uh, Rick, to keep in mind. Christ is one person, not two persons. He is one person. It's his divine person. That is the only person Jesus is. So he's not schizophrenic. But second, he does have two natures. And the two natures remain distinct. They, 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 you know, one is infinite God, one is a finite human. Um, this is something uh, very much, you know, uh, we have to keep in balance so that uh, it's, uh, his two natures are not uh, mixed together. It's not sort of a stew <laughs> because you you have to have, um, you know, this, you know, distinction uh, between the two natures because they're of completely different orders, finite and infinite, created and uncreated, human, divine. These are important distinctions. Now, it is only, as you're correct, only the human nature could suffer death. Uh, divinity, God can't die. That's contrary to the very nature of uncreated God. No creature can kill the uncreated uh, uh, div divinity. But the human nature could suffer and die. So that did happen. But, you know, uh, so that, that's what's going on with the crucifixion. But he always acted uh, with both natures together. So he had a human will and a divine will. Both of them are present. Uh, there was a, a heresy that came up, I think, in the 6th century uh, called monothelitism, which means that he has only one will. Um, and, you know, th that was rejected very clearly and strongly. He has a human will that you see in Gethsemane when he says, uh, if it be your will, let this pass. That was Christ's human will speaking, you know, uh, that's reacting against the suffering of death. But his own choice is not my will, but thy will be done that he does the will of the Father. But he's, uh, it also shows that he is distinct from the Father, very important element as well. So these are some of the mysteries about it that you may want to, um, uh, you know, further uh, study on Christology and take a look at some of the early councils. Um, I think, uh, oh, I always forget his name. It's been quite a, it's been a few decades since I read his book, but I use it as a resource. But it's it's the doctrines of the Catholic Church, and um, it might come back to me in a, a minute um, as to the author. But it's really a fine way to try to keep those tensions uh, clear 
indistinct. Uh, when you read the councils and study Christology, it'd be good to study one of the uh, very old Christologies. That's a good thing to do. We have a caller online. Anne, what can we do for you? Anne, are you there? No. How we no. reconcile. Oh, oh reconcile okay, there you are. Uh, I didn't hear you. W would you start your question again, Anne? Yes, Father. Father, how do we... Fading out. You lost her there. Oh, do you hear oh, me? Now I do. You're fading in and out. Okay. Um, let, me go, let me go to another room. All right, Father. My, here's my question. Yeah. Um... But how do we reconcile the two statements of Christ? Mm -hmm. one, on, one on Good Friday, mm -hmm. when he says to the thief, you will be with me today in paradise. Mm -hmm. And then on Easter Sunday, he says, uh, when he rises, he says to Ma Mary Magdalene, do not touch me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Mm -hmm. And I'll hang up and listen to your answer. Okay. Well, one. Thank you, Father. A, you're welcome, man. Uh, one of the big differences is that the thief was about to die, and Mary Magdalene was going to continue very much alive for a while. And he would uh, remember when Christ died, his human soul. Go, going back now to the the, the human nature of Christ. His human soul went to what St. Peter called in 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 18 and following, the prison where all the other souls were. All the people who had died before his crucifixion were in that prison. But those who were close to the uh, saints of the Old Testament uh, were said to be, uh, they're given different names for where, where their position was. Remember in the uh, story of Lazarus and the rich man, that Lazarus went to the bosom of Abraham. And others would call it the paradise of the fathers. Uh, these different names were given to it. And Christ is consoling a dying man uh, who's already been convicted of crime and is being crucified. Um, you know, he might not console him so much by saying, uh, this day you'll be with me in the prison of souls. You know, uh, th that's probably not consoling to a criminal. Uh, there, you know, but to say that you'll be in paradise emphasizes another part of it, that uh, this is where Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and Solomon were, and Christ went there to preach to all those souls. So he tells the thief he'll be with him there. With Mary Magdalene in the resurrection, he is preparing to open the gates of heaven. And in fact, all of those souls who had already died would be then allowed to come into heaven. No one could go to heaven. And it's very interesting when you take a look at the Old Testament. They never say that anybody's going to go to heaven. They, they, they don't have a sense of going to heaven yet because heaven wasn't open. It was still closed until Christ died, rose, and ascended into heaven and opened the gates of heaven. That's why we always pray Psalm 24 on the Feast of the Ascension. Open wide ye gates. Here comes the King of glory. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. That they talk about that opening up of the gates. Then they would all go into heaven. Whereas Mary Magdalene, it's not just that she isn't supposed to touch him. She's not supposed to hang on to him, to cling to him. It, you see that she was clinging. You can't hold on to Jesus in the resurrection 
He has to ascend to the Father so he can open up the gates of heaven. And then as we see after the uh, ascension, Psalm 110 verse 1 gets fulfilled. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. We say it in the creed, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. That's after the ascension that he is seated at the right hand of the Father because he's opened up heaven. But that's not the case for Mary Magdalene. She has to go and tell the apostles that, that she saw Jesus. That's her task. She still has a mission. In fact, her, her nickname among the fathers of the church is that she is the apostle to the apostles. And so she has a work to do. She can't cling on to Jesus, can't hold on to him. She has to let him go and finish off the work of salvation. Whereas the thief is going to be dead and he'll be with Christ in the next world. Okay. All right. And then we have uh, an email from Nancy. And Nancy writes, let's see, I'm looking for her email. Oh, there it is. Nancy, why did they move the abusive priest to other parishes instead of sequestering them? Nancy, great question, Nancy. One of the problems that had occurred during the abuse crisis is they sent a number of the priests to get some psychological help. And they sent them to a, a number of these centers. And when they had been there for a while, the psychologists and sexologists who were on the staff said to their bishops and superiors, well, th now they're, they've worked through it. It's okay to reassign them. They didn't understand. And by the way, and Various folks, especially from the Kinsey Institute of Sex Research, had gone around the states getting rape and child sex abuse decriminalized. In many states, it wasn't a crime. Amazingly enough, shockingly enough. And so they just thought it was a psychological problem and that it was taken care of, and it wasn't. There's another set of dynamics. And I'm afraid, especially for the victims, they learned it the hard way. And also, these things have been criminalized. It is a crime. And it's something that, you know, needs to be addressed as crime, whether by clergy or by a rate of four and a half times as much by teachers in the public schools, and even worse, on family situations. This is a very serious issue, and it has to be just criminally, as well as psychologically and spiritually. All right, thank you. Uh, we've run out of time, and may the Lord bless you and keep you, cause His face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we ask you to keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, because that's the only way we can pay our bills and bring you this and all the other programs that we have. God bless you all for your support, and thank you.